All right. Hey there, everybody. How are you guys doing? So I have Becca Halstead with me today, and we're going to talk about her journey and and uh, what she's done. And I was really just intrigued with some concept where a couple of you guys had uh, approached me and wanted to chat uh, with Becca and, and understand a little bit about her and her process and, and what she's done. And so I was really, really uh, excited when she accepted this. Thank you, Becca. <laughs> and uh, and so what we're going to do here in this conversation is we're going to talk a little bit about her journey, where she is now, a little bit about her journey, what she's done to get here, and then see if we can't get some advice out of her about how we um, become better uh, game artists and and kind of you know follow our dreams. So Becca, thanks so much for for being here. Happy to be here. Yeah, awesome. it's exciting. So why don't you start with what uh, what you're doing now? Um, so I'm uh, I'm living out of Chicago, which is uh, one of my favorite cities in the world. And um, I'm doing a lot of freelance. I'm doing a lot of mentoring. Uh, I recently started a Patreon. Uh, to have a feed exclusively uh, for my work because yeah. uh, I tend to be a little bit more scattered on other social media. Um, and I'm I'm really just doing a lot of uh, personal work and experimenting, and it's been fun. All right. So you're in Chicago not because there's a game studio or, or there's a job there. You're there just because you want to be there? Yeah, I've got um, – I went to school in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to school for game art, and I – uh, I grew up in the Midwest, and I really loved my time in Chicago during school. And so um, I had done some work here, but I mostly moved back because I just I love the community. Uh, and also the cost of living is uh, a little lower than, than some places like California. Um, and I wanted to try, try some freelance independent stuff, and um, it just made a lot of sense to come to come back and uh, be here. That's awesome. That's great. So we're going to get to talk about what it's like to be a freelancer and, and how you keep that going. Um, awesome. Sure. So, so tell me about your uh, schooling. So what did you do school-wise? Uh, I went to school, uh, like I said, in Chicago mm -hmm. for game art specifically. Yeah. Uh, but before that, I also went to, I went, um, to a design school in Cincinnati. I went to a design school called... Uh, College of uh, Design, Art, Architecture, and Planning, also known as DAP at University of Cincinnati. Okay. Uh, and it's it's a very traditional program. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very traditional design program. Um, industrial design is, is very traditional. It's very fundamentals heavy. And you're really, like, industrial design in general is a very flexible uh, role. Mm -hmm. And in my experience with it, like all that we focused on was fundamentals and craftsmanship. And uh, that was a really big part of my education, even though I was only there for about three semesters. Um, and then transferred up to Chicago uh, for game art, because as much as I found the industrial design program empowering, I also got really bored of drawing hair dryers and I wanted to draw <laughs> characters and uh, creatures and do more digital painting. Mm. Um, did it, uh, did the design really give you a solid grounding in the, in drawing and elements of that or? Yes, it was an essential experience to have. And uh, it really gave me a platform to stand on mm -hmm. as I explored digital painting. And I did a lot of self teaching of digital art in general. Mm. And then when you went into game arts and you, you went into that program, did you focus on 3D, 2D? Were there op options? There was – the program I went to specifically was pretty focused on 3D. Uh, and so I took, a, I took some 3D classes. I was also really fortunate. Like one of the really good things about going to a game-specific college program. Um, mm -hmm. I, I tend to like, I talk about it a lot cause I have a lot of feelings on, um, on those sorts of programs, but one of the really awesome, um, strengths of them is that you can take classes in other disciplines. And because of that, you can communicate with people in other disciplines better. Um, so I took some like basic programming classes and like some basic design classes and stuff. Uh, and I took 3d courses 
And as much as I loved 3D, I was doing a lot of experimenting in my free time mm -hmm. uh, with painting. And I found myself to be really drawn towards that. And so I... Um, I kind of, I really tinkered, <laughs> tinkered is a very gentle way to put it. Um, I really messed around with the curriculum a lot and I did a lot of substituting courses and taking independent studies uh, and did a lot of like going out of my way to make what I was doing in my free time as incorporated into my class curriculum as possible. So. Got I was it. really lucky. I was really lucky to go to a school that allowed me to do that. Uh, yeah. Frankly, but yeah. So you said you had some strong feelings. Yeah. What? The, <laughs> wh how do? How do they get this? Should we start with how they get this wrong, or how? Or or how they do it well? What What are the strong feelings um, about? I think, like in general, I think a lot of those feelings come from specifically going to a very traditional design school mm -hmm. and then coming into this this new field. Uh, in which we're kind of figuring out this this field of education and the best way to teach it. Uh, the you know like when I when I was studying industrial design again, like all we were focused on was like craftsmanship and and um, and and the fundamentals and the basics and like really honing that. And so we I, like I remember having maybe two or three classes that were literally just like, all right, we're going to spend the next nine weeks drawing cubes and cylinders. Mm. Um, and, you know, I don't think that uh, games don't have a place in higher education. I think we're just still figuring it out. Um, and I think though that focus on, on fundamentals and the, and the basics and really nailing those down before, uh, moving on from them is is something that we we haven't maybe emphasized as much as we could so mm. yeah, i it's think a that's tough, a big part of it it's a tough one when you have to teach like this engineering aspect of the software but then mm -hmm. you actually have to teach a craft to you know edges um you know clean yeah. form verse when it gets noisy, because you can get noisy form in, in a 3D model just as quick right. as you can in a drawing. So it's a Absolutely. tough one, you know? Yeah, and it's, it's, it's interesting with uh, digital art, I think, specifically, because it's, it's this weird mix of learning not only the art side of things, but also learning the tools and also learning the design side. Mm -hmm. uh, I think something that I lacked while I was exploring digital painting and I was figuring out rendering and blending and uh, how to keep edges clean and using, you know, the in and outs of Photoshop mm -hmm. uh, was that I was lacking some like storytelling and I was lacking design skills and designing is its own entire field to practice. Um, it, it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of practice and feedback in order to build up what good design actually looks like. So. Yeah, yeah that lot. makes sense. <laughs> so from your perspective, um, you know, in you mentor now, right? Yes. Yeah. So, so what are some of the ways that um, you think people benefit the most in terms of learning this craft? Well, I think, um, I mean, like for me personally, uh, like on a personal level, mm -hmm. there's something like really <laughs> freaking fun and and playful and exciting about working in these like fantasy worlds and working in this very like playful field um no. and such and the nice thing about one-on-one -on -one mentorships specifically uh is that you are really really getting that individual specific feedback directed um right at your work no. not not it not at hypotheticals not at uh, this overarching curriculum that you have to follow. It's just like, let's talk about what you're putting in front of me and how to make it better. Mm. Awesome. So coaching, making sure that you're in small group classes probably. Yeah. Yeah. And there's like, there's so much of that that you can do like in a school in a traditional setting, et cetera. Um, I've just found like as a, as a mentor, like one-on-one -on -one or like small groups is like, it's really fun because it is very, um, it's very specific. I in in colleges 
in traditional colleges, uh, it's very easy to end up in a class of you know 25 or 30 people, and that's uh, you can you can learn a lot in that way. And it's nice to have that collaborative group uh, process and setting. Um, of of course, uh, it's just a different way to approach education, I think. Got it. Great. And I, and I want to get to the Patreon stuff and how that goes, but I think maybe if we can sure. um, bring this to people here for a second and say, like, what, let's talk a little bit about what a concept artist is and what is it that you do or are expected to do? Cool. Yeah. Um, so I have a, hmm, it's kind of a tough question. It's one that's asked a lot. Mm -hmm. And the, the very simple uh, differentiation between uh, specifically a concept artist and an illustrator, which is uh, the two fields that tend to get mixed up the most, is that the concept artist is a visual problem solver. And their entire job is to answer visual questions and to solve problems and unknowns and fill in the gaps. Uh, and an illustrator is more so taking these, uh, you know, these character designs or these props and icons and all of these different uh, designs that have a lot of their um, questions answered and using them, turning them into the products, turning them into the selling point. Um, and so there's like, of course, there's a lot of overlap. There are a lot of people that do both, uh, which is awesome. Uh, but the purpose of a concept art piece is, is uh, fundamentally different than the purpose of, uh, you know, like a marketing illustration or icon work. Yeah, I think that's a great thing that you brought up, um, that it is this difference between concept and illustration. Yeah. And uh, and that's, I think it's a key component because they both use the same skills, but they're very different jobs. And, you know, you, you have a different... Um, what do you say? A uh, work product. So in concept, what would be an example of a work product that you, you know, so you, somebody wants? So uh, my first full-time uh, strictly concept job mm -hmm. was working on Injustice 2. Uh, and so when, when I was working on a prop there or a weapon or a paint over, um, the process looks more, um, it's illustration and uh, concept are, are both very collaborative mm -hmm. in nature, uh, but concept art specifically, uh, I'd be working, I'd be talking to the weapon designer, I'd be talking to my lead, I'd be talking to the producer, I'd be talking to um, like sometimes the animators, et cetera, to figure out, okay, like what at this core, at the core of this weapon, like what and I'm try am I trying to solve? What am I trying to piece together? Mm -hmm. And um, so as an example, like working on uh, a weapon that sprays like snow and ice. So, so I imagine like, uh, like May from Overwatch or Captain Cold or, or something like that. Like yeah. you don't have this like individual projectile that you're shooting. Yeah. So it's not going to look like a traditional pistol. And so you have to figure out and, and do some research and figure out, okay, like what does, uh, you know, the, what, what does the shape look like? What is, is there like a storage container attached? Is there a pipe that's leading or like a, a cable or something that's like leading to something else that feeds um, the ammunition Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's very like solving what do these individual pieces of this weapon need to be from like a conceptual level yeah. and then how can I visualize it in a way that's elegant? Um, so kind of, like I said before, there's, there's the art side, there's the, the rendering and the, um, you know, understanding how to paint light and form and use color. And there's the design stage and the design stage is like, really what the concept artist role is about. Uh, and that's figuring out how to make something functional mm -hmm. and also something that's beautiful and that's hard, but it's super fun. So what are some of the considerations that you have in terms of the functional side of it? So you said like, is there a storage container? Is there a hose coming out of it? Um, what are the other things that you have to consider when somebody says, or, you know, let's start with this and then we get to that. Like, what would be a typical example? Is it like, hey, we need a knife or, hey, we need a gun or, hey, we need, um, you know, a, a throne or something like that? Like, how, what's that first impetus that they give you? 
Uh, so it kind of varies by by prompt. It varies by you know role and company, uh, yeah. of course. But uh, the the first thing that they always go to is like they uh, the prompt should always start like big. It should start on a macro level. Like we need a uh, like a huge knife for this guy to uh, cut down. Um, you know, like maybe some like brush or something while he's right. going through the jungle. Yeah. Um, and it's like, okay, well, so we're going kind of machete style. And then, uh, you know, you have to do the research on like the character. It's like, like going and finding the concept art of the character or finding like old, like traditional art of the character and figuring out, like pulling from that to figure out like, okay, these are the materials that I should be using. Like this guy wears a lot of like, leather and uh like heavy cloth uh he always has like a big uh leather bag or something like i can use that for the for the handle um here's like this like really dark metal that's on the like clasps of his clothes and stuff and like using that to match you know the rest of the design this this prop or whatever that you're creating because that makes it uh, more cohesive but a lot of it just comes down to to research and um and uh, implementing the information that you're finding into mm -hmm. this, like this other piece of this character, uh, so that's cohesive and uh, makes sense story-wise. A lot of it comes down to just like story too. Yeah. That's that's a huge part of it. Okay, all right. So start with the big pictures, and then um, in terms of gathering reference and things like this, is this just a bunch of Google searches? Or are you? Um... Are you having to look at the anatomy of how things are constructed or, you know, how, how, how do you start to dig information? Uh, Google search is always a good start, yeah. <laughs> especially for something, uh, for when you're working on like a pre-existing IP, right? Yeah. So working on like Harley Quinn, it's like, okay, what makes, what motifs make Harley Quinn, Harley Quinn? Great. Yeah. Uh, I also just like for for every artist in general, especially for concept artists, I recommend building up a visual library so that you have an existing uh, library of images to pull from. Mm -hmm. I like Pinterest. Um, it has its you know its flaws and its um, and its strengths. But what's really nice about it is that you can, you know, there's, they have a Chrome plugin that you can download. So you can just bam, like you can save yeah. images. Um, but also it shows related images, which is really nice because you can do a lot of research, literally just like clicking around Pinterest, uh, finding something that's like interesting and related, uh, going to its source uh, website or whatnot and doing research that way which is really nice do you gather like a hundred or a thousand images do you you know i know everybody's different but some people gather yeah. a ton um i have a ton <laughs> uh, i can actually go to i can put it on my pinterest page yeah um i they used to show how many pins you have i have okay yeah i have like 4500 pins nice um <laughs> And that's gathered over the last like several years, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that, what that is, is like browsing on ArtStation and and Twitter and uh, all of these different sources. And like when I find something that's like elegant or or beautiful or has an aspect of it that it, like really like speaks to me, I don't have to necessarily know exactly what it is. Um, I save it and I organize it by board. Um, a really important part of building a visual library is making sure it's at least a little organized because mm -hmm. uh, it's very easy to just save things into one giant folder and then want to go find it later and be like, oh, it's, you know, 200 images down. That's that's not totally helpful. <laughs> um, yeah, and tell me uh, about, you used a word that I think is really important for us to understand, especially in game arts, but... Um, tell me about this motif. Like, what is an example of a motif? Cool. Uh, so, a motif motif is really, really important in concept art. It's important when um, you're again, like when you're working on like a pre-existing character in a mm -hmm. universe, yeah. which you usually are, because like you're usually as an artist uh, brought in at some point, kind of 
like when the project is already started. So uh, being able to adapt to a pre-existing game is uh, in universe is really important and powerful. Right. And that's stylistically, but that's also, um, you know, the shape language and like all of these different parts of it. So like a motif is, um, it's a shape, it's uh, a symbol, it's like a logo, it's it's a piece that, uh, and I'm, I don't know if I'm going to, you know, describe this perfectly, mm -hmm. but um, it, it's a uh, part of an image that just like kind of comes back around to the to the theme and the main core of what makes um, you know a character that that specific character or that universe that specific universe. Um, so like for Harley Quinn, you have the the diamonds. Um, mm -hmm. Like that's a huge like Harley Quinn motif. Um, in the way, in a way, like color can be that too. Like red, white, and black is, you know, super Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. Um, so it can like it kind of varies by context, but it's knowing how to use motifs. Um, it's also knowing how to use them impactfully and not like using them, like overusing them or um making them too subtle. It's, it's a balancing act with them for sure. How do you start, um, and just your process? Cause I noticed up in your art station, you have a whole bunch, you had a, a process. Um, Oh yeah. Link. So how do you start when you're developing? Cause I, you know, I deal a lot with people that are on the 3d side of it, but a lot of us on the 3d side also love to draw and, and break these things out. So, um, how do you start a project or an idea? And I mean, the, just the mechanics of it. Um, so I always start with research. I, I always start with research mm -hmm. and research can come in a lot of different forms and it can have a lot of different purposes. Yeah. Um, I like to save my references into the Photoshop file that I'm working in so mm -hmm. I don't lose it and have to find it again later. Yeah. Um, but even before I'm sketching, I do research and once I have a bunch of references gathered and that can vary from like three to like two dozen, mm -hmm. uh, it, it really just depends on what the need and the purpose of those. Ah, you warned me one second, one second guys, internet popped out. It'll come back in six seconds. Hopefully. <laughs> All right. Um, great. Yeah, we're gonna do the we're gonna do Q and A. I'm gonna make sure we leave room for that. Um, Becca warned me at the beginning that her internet uh, drops out. So. Let me make sure that she knows that she's out. Oh, there we go. Can oh, you hear right. me again? Yes. <laughs> there we you go. You warned us. Yep. Uh, so you were saying you start with reference <laughs> and all that. Yes. Um, I always start with reference. And I can actually pull up. Let me see if I can find this thread. Um, so I followed this process pretty closely. You with... may have to reshare your screen. It might be stuck at the old. Yeah, there we go. That should work. Okay, cool. Um, One second, it's not come back yet. Yep, make sure you click the um, share screen icon. Uh-oh, 
Becca went off again. What do you guys need to or want to um, learn from a concept artist? Why don't we start with some questions from you guys? What would be really impactful for you to understand? Especially for some of the, you guys who are here um, and doing characters. Leave that in the, in the chat um, or if anybody wants to pop on. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> uh, yep. I figured it always, it also only happens when I need the internet to be consistent. Um, naturally. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to make you presenter. I think you are, uh, yeah, you're already still presenter. So it's just a matter of sharing your screen. Okay. Let me try to get that working again. Is that showing? Yeah. I might have to. Okay, cool. Um, oh, and I saw the questions in chat. Uh, should I answer those now or no, no, we'll, we'll open up for that. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so, so recently I participated in the art station challenge, mm -hmm. which I highly recommend doing as an artist in general, having a deadline, like making a project, uh, and having to kind of handle the scope of that project based yeah. on that deadline is a fantastic challenge. Uh, highly recommended. Mm -hmm. uh, but through that, I documented a bunch of the process that I go through when I'm designing a character, a prop, uh, an environment piece. Uh, and again, like I said, I always start with research and yeah. I save it locally so that I don't have to open up a bunch of tabs again later. Um, and then I do a lot of sketching. And for this project specifically, uh, I did a lot of sketching on paper. I have found when I have a pretty clear image in my mind, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I just find it more nat more natural to sketch uh, traditionally because, you know, I learned how to draw on paper. Uh, that was that was the first step. And so sometimes it, it comes a little bit more natural and a little bit more organically. Um, when I'm working on something that's pretty large scale that has a, pretty clear deadline. I do like to make a 3D block in. Um, and I don't do this for every project, mm -hmm. but it, it's a time saver. And so I do recommend to a lot of concept artists, like learn a little bit of 3D, um, go into, go and try Blender or whatever you have access to. It doesn't, it doesn't matter which package uh, you use because at the end of the day, all of the principles transfer over. Um, it's just a matter of learning different tools at that point. Um, and that sets up a lot of uh, spatial issues that I can solve. And um, I can kind of figure out what this looks like as a 3D object. Mm -hmm. And if you're working in a studio, that's that's a block in that you can pass on to the 3D modeler um, to expand upon. Mm. Um, and so that can be a time saver th for them as well. And it makes your orthographics more accurate. Also helpful. Yeah. Um, a lot of my sketches are really rough. Uh, like this top row. That's what my sketches actually look like. And sketching is mostly figuring out shape language, uh, silhouette, and storytelling. Um, if you work in silhouette instead of line sketches, uh, you can figure out some materiality yeah. and you can figure out values, which can be really helpful, but that just c comes down to personal preference. Um, I had a pretty clear idea in my mind of what this was going to be mm -hmm. from the get go. But even within that, there's a lot of stuff to figure out. Uh, so like, what does this like, um, like what is the where are the shapes of like the doors and the windows? Um, what's the shape language of the sign um, of the silhouette of the wagon itself? Yeah. Uh, Etc. Um, and then from there, I go to line art. 
And line art, again, is just drawing over that 3D base. And this comes down to really polishing that shape language, uh, figuring out how materials are broken up, uh, figuring out details and where I can bring in storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, there's parts of this that I didn't get to. That I just didn't have time for it to bring into the final project. Like I wanted to have like some herbs and skulls and stuff, and that would have been really cool. Um, but you know, in at this point, it really just comes down to finishing up that problem solving stage, finishing up as much of that design stage as possible, um, and then moving on. That's great. That's really awesome to see that um, that breakdown. So I, I got just a couple of questions before we move into any of the rendering side of it. Um, sure. Yes. So you said the the sketches that you make they're very simple, and and um, so what kind of you know because a lot one of the well so this is this is a, a it's a hard question to ask, but one sure. of the things that. Um, I think stops a lot of us, like especially we're looking here is um, what is expected at this stage and and on top of that, you know what are the skills that somebody needs to have to to really get in there and be a concept artist and start to explore our ideas and I say this along the spectrum of like I'm traditionally trained, so you know my contemporaries you, you might end up in an atelier in Florence. Uh, yeah, you know where that's like one drawing. But I remember, you know, there was this um, incident where I had, I was having my work reviewed, and I can, I can draw reasonably well. You put something in front of me, and um, and the assignment was this storyboard thing, and this guy puts his foot into a puddle, and uh, and then out of the puddle, right? And so I draw this person mm -hmm. putting their foot in in this kind of puddle, and that was that. And the guy reviewing it goes, "Hey, uh, yeah, you got to throw some splashes in here." And I'm thinking to myself, "Shit." How do you draw splashes? <laughs> I'm like, okay, so I'm going to have to go get some reference and fast motion photography and all of that stuff that's like going on in the back yeah. of my head. And so I yeah. asked the guy and I'm like, yeah, you know, and, and how would you do that? It just real quick, like off the cuff, right? But I'm like freaking out. And, uh, <laughs> and so he draws my, he grabs my paper and he just says like three little quick squiggly lines and has this like weird look on his face. Like, how can you draw this well and be this dumb? <laughs> you know? <laughs> That was very yeah, funny. Yeah. It was uh, definitely I had like I had a different skill set than than what yeah. he was looking for. So I did not get that internship. Um oh, no. so what is what is it that people are required? Like what's expected and how loose and how tight, you know. How do you think so, about of all that? Yeah, I mean like the sketch stage, first of all, like as students as young artists, um in like all artists, I think in general, um, I think it's very easy to see like really beautiful, amazing like Instagram picture sketchbooks yes, right. that are all like so clean uh, and they're just like they're like flipping through the pages and every single yeah. one looks like a finished piece and it's just like yeah I'm just sketching it's like that's probably sketching for them but I see that and I'm like oh my god <laughs> <laughs> am I supposed to do that exactly. um, <laughs> And it took me a while to uh, accept that that's just not how I sketch, at mm -hmm. least not right now. Yeah. And like a sketch doesn't have to be this like insane finished drawing, because a sketch at the end of the day, especially when you're um, when you're a concept artist and you're you're going through this like this series of rapid iteration and you're trying to polish the idea before making it, you know, like a rendered beautiful final piece is mm -hmm. that you're just capturing the essence of the design. Um, so like all these like really messy, um, like clumsy sketches, like especially up here uh, on this page. Yeah. Um, like all it's doing is figuring out like what does the sil side silhouette look like? And it's not exactly what it's going to look like or anything. Um, but it's kind of like figuring out like weight distribution and how can I make this look interesting from different angles mm -hmm. uh how you know what is the the very rough setup of uh the front of it like where do people sit um and i think it's like kind of letting go of that like wanting to make something insane and beautiful mm -hmm. uh i think that's like really i mean it's been really empowering for me <laughs> it's been like super important for me mm -hmm. um as a concept artist, 
because uh, let me see if I can find really quick uh, stuff from my time at Netherrealm with some sketches. Pretty sure I... Oh, here we go. Um, so, like, when I'm working on a prop design mm -hmm. um, and I have a deadline and I have a prompt that I'm working with, um, uh, like this is the final image, uh, and they're not made to be super functional things. They were literally just like, this is a weapon in the background and we just need it to look super cool. Uh, and, um, you know, they gave me some references of like what they liked in, um, weapons from like other media, from movies and stuff. Uh, this is like the second pass. Um, you know, because you have, like, the sketch stage, and then you have a refinement stage, and then you have a render stage, um, if you're lucky and you have time for it. Um, <laughs> but, like, this is... These are, like, drawings over sketches that look like this. Mm -hmm. And so when you're doing that sketch stage and you're getting, like, super caught up in, like, the details and stuff, I think it's really important as an artist... Um, to remember that, you know, this is the problem solving, um, and not like the final image is like the problems have been solved and you're just making them, you're making them pretty and rendered and beautiful, but all of the, like all the messiness of art, all the messiness of design is really where, you know, your brain has to kick in and, um, you have to do a lot of just like thinking and experimenting and experimenting by nature is messy. Um, but that's where you, you know, have those happy mistakes and you find stuff that's like actually really interesting. I love that. That's great. You know, and, and most of those beautiful Instagram sketchbooks are usually like drawings of people and things that exist. So yeah. You know, or like really second or, or like the second pass on something, right? Yeah. Like they have a messy sketch and then they refine it and put it into a sketchbook. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, and so uh, I think um, there's a couple of questions here. So Andrew is asking, how fast are we supposed to design characters? And I know that that all varies. Um, so if you can just give us some parameters on like what you're expected to do in a day or a 24-hour period or a week or a month. Yeah, it it, it really depends on um, it depends on the project that you're working on, and it depends on the timeline of that project. Um, so something like this is something that I'm doing in my personal time over like a few weeks. Mm -hmm. And something like this is something that has to be done like by tomorrow afternoon. And so um, with characters, like characters are obviously a really important part of a project. And so more time tends to go into them, but being able to work really quickly um, it, like it really, really helps in a studio setting, even if you have more time, because that yeah. gives um, that that provides time for more iteration and more passes on on the design itself and making sure that the design of that character is like what it needs to be. So it could be something that's needed in a few days, or it's something that um, uh, and you see this in film a lot. You know, you you have a full day to just figure out what their hair looks like what their hairstyle looks like. Um, and you see that I think a little bit more in film than games is my understanding. Uh, but it, it really does vary by project. Got it. Sure. And uh, so when you're drawing and doing this, we're looking at a 2D kind of an orthographic view. How important is it for you to start to think about 3D as you pull this these designs together? Um, if you're working on a 3D project, you should be thinking in 3D or um, at least thinking in 3D at all stages of uh, of the process. Mm -hmm. um, so, like, even though these are all orthographic um, and very, like, very much side views, yeah. uh, when I'm doing these individual weapons, if this is something that's going to be passed on to a 3D modeler the less questions that they have to ask me, um, the better, which is especially essential when you're a concept artist working um, 
on concepts that are going to be passed to uh, outsourcers because they cannot ask you questions. And so you have to provide all of the answers in the first pass. So with something like this, um, it's kind of hard to take this flat side angle and interpret it uh, spatially. And so what I did was I took, uh, you know, a half a day, a few hours, and I modeled it out and I answered all of the questions for them. Got it. Got it. All right. So you're not leave. I mean, I imagine there's some problems you have to leave for the modeling. You know, there's yeah. just, some things are going to get figured out. How do you start to make that distinction between what you have to figure out and what is just, you know, going to get figured out? Um, a lot of it honestly comes down to time uh, and how much time you have to spend on a concept, on an individual project like uh, that Gatling gun. Um, I don't always have time. I don't have the liberty to spend half a day on just like this 3D model for something that's probably going to change around a little bit anyways. Because mm -hmm. um, as much as you can think in 3D and... Uh, work in 3D, there's always a lot of factors that um, are just going to be unknowns until later in the pipeline. Right. Um, and that comes in a lot with um, segments of a prop or a character or something along those lines that, that are animated. Mm -hmm. um, something that needs to have a rig on it and needs to be able to move and function in 3D space in an interesting way. Um, that's going to cause changes in the concept. Um, understanding how um, something is held by a character. Sometimes, like maybe if you have something that they hold on their side and you have a bunch of stuff like kind of popping off of it, yeah. Um, that just means that it's going to clip into their leg and they're going to have to remove some parts. It just, you know, it, it's um, working with the designers and working with the animators and keeping really open communication while you're designing is really important uh, so that you can kind of try to do as much of that problem solving as early as possible and, you know, identifying potential issues. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's always going to be stuff that's just like, nope, we need to change this so that this makes sense <laughs> Got it. once it's actually in the game. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, so a couple more minutes, guys. Ask uh, all the questions you got right now. Get those going to me. Um, I've got a couple more I want to ask. Uh, but Sari is saying, um, do you photo bash in your concept work? Uh, it depends on what I'm doing. Uh, so for stylized work, I basically never photo bash. Mm -hmm. um, this is completely hand painted uh, over that. Let me see if I can just scroll down over this block in. Mm -hmm. um, for more realistic concepts, and I actually have one here. Um, this has photo bashing of textures in it. Um, but what you can see in the like process GIF that I have mm -hmm. uh, is that before I put down any photo textures, before I take any shortcuts, I make sure that the forms are really clear. Mm -hmm. I make sure the values of the different materials are very clear. Yeah. Um, and I make sure that I have like all of the functionality figured out and everything. And then I use photo textures as extra, you know, as like bonus mm -hmm. rather than relying on them to make it um, to, to, to clarify any problem points. Got it. So it's just kind of tertiary texturing. Yeah. Removing. And it's, it's a lot of subtlety too. Yeah. Okay. So. The subtlety that basically is hard to paint. It takes time to paint. Right, exactly. It's like it's like um, the difference between using a textured brush and just mm -hmm. like a hard round brush. Mm -hmm. um, you know, textured brushes uh, are great, but at the end of the day, they're just shortcuts. And I generally really recommend learning how to paint. If you really want to be an awesome painter, learn how to paint with a simple brush. And that can literally be... Here, I actually... And that can be a hard round brush. Um, and I actually just worked on this today um, as a demo um, this for is something. This for your Patreon people, right? Yeah. And this is all with just like a hard round brush in Photoshop. Oh, wow. Okay. So I just, I really recommend 
learning how to work with the simplest tools possible and, mm -hmm. you know, getting those principles down and like really practicing those wow. and then using, you know, those, those extra tools using, uh, you know, the stuff that's, that's extra, that's shortcuts using that as, um, you know, an extra tool instead of as a crutch. I think that's really important. That's great. That's awesome. All right. And uh, so why don't we do this? You want to head over to your Patreon um, as well, just so that they know uh, where to find you. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that's on your art station as well. Uh, so you guys know where to find her. And uh, and then there's this. And so uh, tell me about your Patreon. Like, what do you offer there and how um, – how have you found that? Because I, I was reading, you know, yeah. it was hard for you to be updating all of these different sites. So you just like you were like, I'm gonna just put it here. <laughs> That's that. I tend to like um because <laughs> you want to give, yeah. right? Like I, I know you can yeah. you're, you're a giver, so yeah, I like I, I love sharing my process with people. Um I love getting feedback from folks. I love interacting with folks that are that are kind of trying to do um something that's similar to what I do and, mm -hmm. and what I create. And so, you know, I have Twitter, but, you know, I also put a bunch of, like, cat GIFs and dog pictures on Twitter. Um, I have Instagram, but I put a bunch of, like, random stuff on there, too. Yeah. Uh, I'm not the most social media um, <laughs> uh, focused person in the world, and eventually yeah. I should probably change that. But I this started as just, like, wanting to have a feed specific for my work. Um, so like having posts that kind of, kind of like how art station is very, just like, this is my art and that's all that's here. And mm -hmm. you can just follow me here and just see my art. And then, um, you know, as I got into it and as, um, I was getting feedback on, on the stuff that I was posting, um, I got a lot of folks that were just like really interested in like, cool. Like I love seeing your work. Glad you're doing um, you know, freelance and like opening up for some commissions and stuff. Mm -hmm. but I really just want to see like more of how you create. Right. And so, um, that's really what it's focused on right now. Um, and kind of like with this, uh, with this whole thread, uh, this like process, uh, showing painting process and, and gifts and explaining my decisions while I'm working. Um, uh, it, it, there's a lot of stuff like that. There's a lot of uh, tutorials and and um, explanations on on how I work, and so um, that's that's really what the the direction that's taken is just like my workflow and um, why I make the decisions that I do while I'm creating. That's awesome. Wow, that's a lot of detailed explanation. This stuff takes time too, so it makes it's great. Um, it makes a lot of sense. And Patreon, I. It's been something I've been following for a while. It's a very interesting model. It is. So. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open this up. I think Greg had one question. Uh, Greg, I know you were asking for Q&A, so maybe I didn't give you enough warning. Yeah. Um, but Greg is saying, I was wondering if you had any favorite resources for learning. That's actually a great way to end this. Thanks, Greg. Yes, I absolutely do. Um, so first of all, mm -hmm. uh, Pinterest has... This is literally how I oh, learned. Great the basics idea. Of yeah. There is a ton of these like mini tutorials, like literally four images um, on Pinterest. Mm. And it, it breaks it down into like the simplest things, like, um, like kind of like, like breaking down the structure of like a face and like expression mm -hmm. um, to these like really, really detailed pieces done by these like super masterful artists. Mm -hmm. um, and these are, these are all over the place and they're fantastic. And so if you end up using Pinterest or something else to kind of build a visual library, uh, I really recommend looking into these because this makes this, th this, this breaks it down into like such simple steps and it makes it very digestible and easy to follow and uh, much less intimidating <laughs> um, than digital art can appear. Um, I also really recommend uh, Control Paint. They have a lot of, you can go to their free video library and um, these are each videos that are like five minutes. And um, it just really, really breaks down digital painting using traditional tools, et cetera, into uh, 
really small bite-sized free again um uh steps and then schoolism is a very excellent resource uh it is not free but it's very good um i specifically recommend this course and the critique sessions i'm sure are awesome um but i just used the subscription um to access uh, the Fundamentals of Lighting course with Sam Nelson. There are a lot of other awesome classes on here, but this one specifically, just doing that 30 bucks for a month, um, maybe access it for two months, that's 60 bucks. And you're gonna learn way more about light um, than you could ever imagine, uh, which is super awesome. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think those are my like top three Great. recommendations. All right, Becca, thank you so much for showing that. So you guys know where to find her on ArtStation and on Patreon so that you know um, how to follow what she's up to and, uh, and get access to different levels of things that she's offering. So thank you so much, Becca. Yeah, glad to help. Good luck, guys. And always feel free to, you know, I've got my email on ArtStation. And if you all have questions later, um, I'm, I'm open to, to answering that. So Sweet. feel free to reach out. All right. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Have a good one, guys. All right. See you guys.